So today we are coming together as different individuals with many different stories, but with one common interest. We want to stop this pipeline. But there is more than stopping this pipeline. There is more than Enbridge. What does the Northern Gateway Project represent? It, it represents the unwillingness of the government to listen to the people whose lives it has been affected by this project. It represents a society that is so dependent on oil that it's willing to put its own people and healthy ecosystems in danger to get it. It represents a value system that prioritizes money over health. It represents an unwillingness of the government and others to face deeply ingrained colonialism. It represents the belief that humans are superior to and separate from nature. And it represents the belief that the economy can grow infinitely on a finite planet. All of these deeper societal issues that this proposed pipeline represents are hazardous to our health and to the health of the earth. Today is about coming together to have conversations about these issues, about what it is in our society that is allowing this, a project like this to be considered. We are not here to be spectators, we are here to be participants, to make a difference in a world that we care about. We are here to organize and to mobilize with our community. Because it's gonna take one hell of a fight to take down Enbridge, and it's gonna take an even bigger fight to change the system that allows it to operate. So up next we have some incredible speakers. First we have a group of friends from ages 8 to 12 who have put together some very important messages to share with us today. After them we'll be hearing from Elena Basil and Mary Vickers, Lisa Mercure from Fort Chip One, and then we're going to march to Centennial Square for some workshops and panelists so we can discuss what we're all here to talk about today. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm here today with some amazing kids who have a very important and truthful message for all of you. First up, we have Naviana. Hi, my name is Naviana, I'm eight years old, I'm Kosilaj and New Channels. I want to protect the land that my ancestors lived on because the oil tankers can hurt it with oil, oil, noise, and exhaust. The tankers are four times the size of baseball fields, and the noise is so loud it can kill a whale. So please do whatever you can to stop the oil tankers. Thank you. And, and now we have Dalton. People need to think about the kind of future they want. Putting in a pipeline so that we can send more dirty oil overseas is not in Canada's best interest. <laughs> not only would a spill kill wildlife, but it would affect the natural resources that provide many sustainable jobs. And a pipeline would feed oil tankers that may do even more damage. The oil tankers m make a lot of noise which affects the ocean wildlife and they spill would kill the tourism and fishing industries. <laughs> Remember the Exxon Valdez? Well, well, you want that happening here? No. In some spots, the banks of the inlet are very near just waiting to happen. The ecosystems would not recover in my lifetime and I don't want our future put at risk just to make the oil barons richer. Thank you. And now we have Luana. Hello, my name is Luana, and as we all know, Kinder Morgan is planning to greatly increase the number of oil tankers passing through our coastal waters. 
If the plan goes on, about one oil tanker will be sailing past our coast every day. And even if there isn't an oil spill, the tankers will kill marine life with their noise and exhaust. The tankers won't just kill fish, but birds and other animals too. Even if only one oil tanker spilled, it would ruin our coast and take decades or possibly centuries to recover. Thank you for listening. And last up, we've got Maya. Hi, my name is Maya. I'm in... Hi, my name is Maya. I'm eight and a half years old. The Pacific coast of Canada is a very beautiful place to live. I love so many things about the coast, such as starfish, orcas, dolphins, salmon, dolphins, seals, sea lions, whales, seagulls. And I love playing at the beaches. If there was an oil spell on the Pacific coast of Canada, the starfish would die, the orcas would die, dolphins would die, seals would die. Whales would die, seagulls would die, salmon would die, and the beaches would be covered with oil. So let's stop the pipeline and the oil tankers. Yeah. Is Milena Basil in the house? Here she is. Hi, it's great to see you all here today. Wow, give yourselves a great big round of applause. My name is Milena Basil, and I come from the Gitanyao and Wet'suwet'en tribes of the Northwest. I have been a guest here on unceded Lekwungen territory since 2010. And it's an honor to be here with you all today. I am just one of many from the Northwest who is opposed to Enbridge and all pipelines and fracking. Yeah. <laughs> I am also here to represent Mother Earth. <laughs> and all our unborn children who we will be leaving this Earth to when we are gone. I believe I have the right to represent Mother Earth because I am a part of Mother Earth. We are of Earth. And what we do to the Earth, we do to ourselves, as a great chief once said. And it seems there has been a clash of world views that has marginalized us from them. The dominant worldview seems to look at the world as a commodity. We can totally understand how we need to change our way of seeing the world by comparing the Western and Indigenous worldviews and by learning how to see ourselves in the big picture. The Western worldview comes from the origin story that hunter-gatherers evolved to higher forms of humans who developed agriculture. This point of view suggests that creation is not complete and needs development. This Western worldview is also tied to the Bible in the words subdue the land and exercising dominion over all non-human life in it. What has this worldview done for our Mother Earth? Tar sands devastation, deforestation, etc. Now let's take a look at some indigenous worldviews. Delgamuch said, the land, the plants, the animals, and the people all have spirit. <sighs> Sorry. They all, have, they all must be shown respect. This is the basis of our law. The 
Tinu Chanuth say Hashuk Ish Tsuak, which means everything is one. The Lakota say Matakwisin, which means we are all related. Many more indigenous people all around the world share these similar views. We are the land. We are suffering from the destruction as well. This is why we need to heal ourselves as well as the earth. It is up to us as individuals to get back to our true selves and get re reconnected with nature and say no to Enbridge. <laughs> No to tar sands. No to destruction. Stop the destruction of Enbridge, who has a history of oil spills since the year 2000, with a total of 132,715 barrels of oil lost through broken pipelines, according to Joyce Nelson, Watershed Sentinel. Gilman Law, LLP, a national law firm in Boston, Massachusetts, reports, quote, recent EPA findings, studies, and lawsuits are raising awareness of potential harmful water contamination that may result from hydraulic fracturing or fracking, unquote. I am here to say that that is not acceptable. It is not acceptable to destroy Mother Nature and our children's future. Our forefathers and matriarchs of these lands have upheld the laws of nature and have lived sustainably and in harmony with nature for thousands of years before contact. We need to turn to our elders for wisdom of how to live harmoniously with our neighbors, the plant beings and the animal beings. The wisdom of our elders is more valuable than gold. I am one of many who has been displaced from my culture, land, and people as a result of genocide and divide and conquer tactics. I refuse to be a victim any longer. <laughs> Trying to live in this monetary system I have ended up being so far removed from myself. Now I am a, on a healing journey back to my heart and I stand tall in solidarity for Mother Earth and all her children because no one is illegal. I stand in solidarity with the Unistaten in their struggles against all pipelines. I stand for my nieces and nephew and all my family and for the unborn. I stand for the trees, the waters, the air that we breathe. I stand for myself who is one with all. I hope to see a brighter future for our children, not just pipe dreams for the benefit of a few. Let's put a stop to Enbridge in all destructive ways and work towards a sustainable future. We can start with ourselves. This is a call out to our collective spirit to rise up against Enbridge, but to also heal ourselves and our relationships with one another and the natural world so we can begin to heal the planet. All my relations. Thank you all for being here and a big thank you to the organizers and Lila and Clem for inviting me to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Milena. Is Lisa Mercure around? Here she is. Tanzanian 
Lisa McKeon is Sikas and Mixu Cree Nihio. My mother is Mixu Cree First Nation. My dad is from Quebec. Originally, my mom is from Hay River, which is in, uh, near Fort Chipewyan. This is Alberta. Um, it's ground zero for the tar sands. You know, I've been searching for a number of years for, for my family, and I'm learning how to be an urban um, Aboriginal, a Cree woman, a Nihio Scoop. After my mother regained her status in 1985 through Bill C-31, and I can tell you now, I'm really proud today to be a proud Nihio school. Um, through my work, through my work with the BC Aboriginal Friendship Centers, I'm really lucky that they've helped me to become the grounded and culturally uh, respectful person that I am today, and they've helped me to support um, and in learning my language and learning my culture to the point where I was comfortable to meet and re, uh, reunite with my family. But it was a really bittersweet moment when I met my family. And I'm sure that you know that uh, people in Fort Chipewyan are dying at incredible rates of cancer. I only have a few cousins left in Fort Chipewyan. Since my visit up to Fort Chipewyan a few years ago, I've been reading all kinds of literature on the tar sands and trying to read every piece of material that comes my way and try to ingest what is happening and try to understand why is my family dying. Half of my family works for the tar sands and half of my family is dying from the tar sands. I'm really grateful today for the organizers and to be allowed uh, time here on the Kwangan territory and um, to find a peaceful way to come around and try to understand together, raise awareness together, and learn about the tar sands from somebody who has been there. Our home community is situated downstream from the, the, to the toxic uh, tar sands development. Fort Chipwan has absorbed almost all of the uh, damage from that project. The extraction of oil from Canada's tar sands is having a devastated impact on the, on the indigenous peoples. My people are dying. Studies have found that high levels of mercury, arsenic, lead and other toxin are at elevated levels near the area's tar sands and the excavation sites. These chemicals are known carcinogens. People know that they're bringing cancer into my community. The most uh, important, or the, uh, the most prominent type of cancer is a bile duct cancer. And normally it, uh, bile duct cancer only happens in a community that's the size of 100,000 or more. But in Fort Chip One, that's 30% higher in our community. My sister, Crystal Le Lehman, a member of the Beaver Cree First Nation, has says it well. We deserve clean drinking water, clean air to breathe, the ability to go to the land to subsist, to hunt, to fish, to forage, to find our medicines that are natural to us. Why? Because it was promised in our treaties. It is a constitutionally protected right. It's an inherent right. But most of all, it's because we are human too. We exist and we are here. And we are not going anywhere. I'm not sure if you know, but a statement of claim was filed by the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, and it has set historical precedents, and they will get their day in court. The judge agrees that the case is unmanageable, and they have been granted based on the law, and the law is clearly in their court. Our constitutionally protected rights are deliberately being ignored and abused, and they have proven that, and they are spreading the truth about the environmental destruction and the disaster that they are living amongst. When we go out to our home territory, my family is living off the land up there, and the fish are filled with cancers, and I'm sure that you've seen all pictures of the fish that are up there that, that just look terrible. These the people that are eating the moose. I've eaten the dry moose up there. I'm sure I've eaten cancer. I've drank the water there, having tea and doing ceremony with my family up there. 
I'm sure I drank cancer. So I tell you, you know, the amount of uh, pain that my families have gone through, what does that mean? What does that mean for our community? when our, the corporations up there are trying to encroach on our traditional territories and infringe on our rights and try to expand their projects. They're planning on expanding at 10 times the size that it is now. And I'm sure that you're aware that uh, the tailing ponds are the size of England right now. And so if you can imagine, 10 times that size of the tailing ponds and how much of that water that is being wasted it takes three to five barrels of water to bring up one barrel of oil. And in that time, um, the water is recycled. Only a portion of that water can be recycled, 5%. So what does that mean when you don't replace what's being taken from Mother Earth? I really am grateful to all the people, the organizers of this the stop the Enbridge pipeline and stop the tar sands and I really encourage you to start to get to know the facts around the tar sands and understand all the impacts that the, the ground zero of the tar sands has caused and the amounts of cancers that is, that is in my home community and learn from that. I can't go back and change that. You know I'm teaching my three daughters now that how important it is to speak up and um, I was so proud of my sister Crystal who is speaking up from the Beaver Cree First Nations. And I will stand beside her as a proud Nihiosku. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. That was beautiful. <laughs> Is uh, Mary Vickers around? Here she is. Colette, I'd like uh, Colette to come up with me to uh, show off her Pacific Wild and so people can make noise. It's an honor to be with every one of you here today. You're beautiful, you're powerful, and we're all human beings. I'm going to say a quote from one of our young men in Heltzik territory. The Heltzik are strong, the Heltzik are ancient, and the Heltzik are united. I'd like to share my time with a beautiful woman, and I'm learning her pronunciation of her name, Nick Slos. I'd like her to come up and take the time with us as well. And Gayasika to everybody for coming out. It's so wonderful to hear the young children today too. You are our future, you are our leaders, and I'm very proud of you for your words today. Gayasika. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the territory that we're on. My traditional name is Nuxgus, and I come from the house of Gwinnanuk. I'm from the Gitsan Nation. And as many of you know, um, unfortunately, one of our lead negotiators signed a $7 million deal with Enbridge. And what I, many of us, it's really divided us, and as many of have talked about, Lisa, Linda, a few others, it's divided our people so much. We have closed down our office in Hazleton. It has been closed down for over 100 days now from the time that we found out as Gitsan people what our leaders were doing on our behalf. We say no to Enbridge. The Gitsan have really stood firm on it. They've made sure that people want to know that they have said no to Enbridge. Seven million dollars will not feed seven generations. <laughs> Thank you. 
And that's what they're offering. That's what they're offering many of the nations. We know that many of our nations are struggling with poverty, with unemployment, with housing crisis. And so many of our nations are being offered $7 million to agree to the pipeline. And what we need to do is get out there and show people that $7 million is not going to be there for us when our great great grandchildren are around. So as many of us continue to live off the land and live out of the ocean, we want to make sure that our voices are heard and that we're saying no to Enbridge, just along with the rest of you. We say no, we'll stand firm and we'll fight it. And finally, my last comment is I want to acknowledge the um, the Clem 2 people. I had the privilege to be in their community for the last two weeks and the Enbridge hearing was there and I listened in to the voices that I heard. It brought tears to my eyes. Tears to my eyes when I heard a grade 4 student get up and speak, a grade 5 student get up and speak, a grade 12 student get up and speak, the elders, the chiefs who all stood up and said no to Enbridge. They wanted to make sure their voices were heard and it just brought tears to my eyes to think that we have to stand up and defend our territory and to be able to stand up and say what do we, why the land and why the water is so important to us as Aboriginal people. And on our own territory, being able to have to live by the rules that Enbridge has put forward. So as all of us, many of us across the uh, Northwest Coast Territory, we all agree, many of us as Aboriginal people, that we will stand firm with everybody else and say no to Enbridge. Keep your fight up. Thank you. <laughs> Is Zoe Blunt here? This is incredibly empowering. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming here. We're gonna we're gonna march away from here in a few minutes, and we're going to come back because this is just the beginning. And I want people to note the dates when we're gonna come back next Saturday. April 21st is Earth Walk. It will be twice as big as this. I want everyone to come back next weekend. And I have an important announcement. I want everybody to get out your cell phones right now. Anybody who has a cell phone, get ready to send a text message. Get ready to send a text message. If you have Twitter, get ready to send a tweet. Has everybody got your phones out? Here's the announcement. This is just the beginning, and the next part of this uprising, this people's uprising against Enbridge, has a name. The name is Camp Christie. That's hashtag Camp Christie. Right here, two weeks, April 29th, Camp Christie. And I want you to say it with me now, if you would. Camp Christie, April 29th. Camp Christie, April 29th. Camp. Christy, April 29th. Camp, Christy, April 29th. Tell everyone and bring your tents, bring your sleeping bags, bring your pillows, and visit us at wildcoast.ca for information. Thank you very much. We'll see you on April 29th. Thank you. So now we're going to move along and march to the streets to Centennial Square where there will be two panels. One panel about decolonization, starting the discussion, and another about other industrial development in the north because Enbridge is not the only plan. There will also be workshops about direct action, Pipeline 101, Pipeline for Kids, and energy alternatives. And also, there's been a key that was lost on the lawn, so if anybody's missing a key, come see me.
And now we're going to be doing some workshops, some panels. Over there, you see a table and it has food, because the lovely folks at Food Not Bombs cook for us. And so there's free, amazing food if you're hungry. And I just want to ask that if there's any elders to let them eat first, um, elders and, and little people. So make room in the line. We're going to get started in about 10 minutes. And we have a bunch of different workshops and panels. At the one right here, we're going to be having a panel on northern mega development. So everything from fracking to different pipelines to the Site C Dam. So if you want to hear more about what's going on in terms of all the other dirty energy projects going on in this province, come to this panel right here. And then we also have an information table. Jenny, where's the information table? It's over there where those people are waving. So if you want more information or you want to give us your name because you want to be invited to future events and you just like to talk to people, go over there. And then we have two other workshops. One is on direct action. And I think it's going to be happening over in the dark area, in the cave, right there. And then the other workshop is a workshop on kind of talking to youth and working with kids. So if you have any kids with you who want to come to this workshop, it'd be a really good one to go to. And that one, what? Okay, but where's the youth one? Okay, if, maybe meet over here, right beside the stage, and we will lead you there because we are not that organized just yet. Give us a couple minutes. And then there's one other workshop, it's called Spirituality and Activism. And I don't know where it is yet, but I'm going to get back on the mic in five minutes and tell you. So talk amongst yourselves, hang out, get some food, and thank you for coming. Okay, here we are, the Raging Grannies. Are we all? Can you hear us? We've been singing songs about the environment for 25 years, and we are still pissed off and raging. We were at Clive Books nearly 20 years ago. Um, two people were in jail and several others were arrested and we're all ready to do it again, so there. Just two songs, initial. One is... Oil spill, oil spill, what a lovely oil spill. The rocks are all gunky, the sand is black. The birds cannot fly and the whales are on track. The sea is all shiny, so pretty to see. Black and oily and heavenly. Thank Harper and Enrich for taking such care of the coastline of lovely BC.
Games on straight. Black and sound where where those people were arrested and the the force was saved. Another example? Hunger strikes and teacher strikes. I heard. Egypt, the uprising, the uh, Egyptian Spring. It's springtime in BC here now. <laughs> the anti-corporate globalization movement, starting in 99, the Quebec City to Occupy. To Occupy is a direct action. And uh, oddly enough, so, did, so are things like battered women's shelters. Once upon a time, battered women's shelters were illegal. You couldn't keep it, you, they would not keep that secret. If a woman was fleeing her abuser, the police would, would tell her where, tell them where she was. There was no legal protection. Gorilla gardens that have now become community gardens. Fruit not bombs is direct action. In some places it's illegal. And, um, you know, we have an obligation, I think, to, uh, to, to do everything we can. Here, you know, we, we run the risk of, of uh, sacrificing some of our comfort, right? Uh, we're, we need to step out of our comfort zone. And uh, what we're going to learn today is some ways to, uh, to, to be strong, to, uh, to be safe, even while we're risking our, our, our uh, freedom, for example, even while we're putting ourselves on the line. And um, the main thing about direct action is not everybody has to risk their freedom. A lot of people, there's a lot of roles that people play and uh, can, can folks do, do one thing for you? Can you put up your hand if you've been involved in a, in a civil disobedience protest? Do you have? you have? you have? Oh, a lot of people here. All right, so you can help me out. Um, so there are a lot of different roles that people play. Not all of them involve sitting on the hot seat. Not all of them involve risking arrest or risking your freedom or safety. There's a lot of support roles as well. And um, now here's some examples of other roles that people play in the civil disobedience action. Media. Film, filming media and film, those could be two different things. Talking to mainstream media to make sure that they know what it's about. And uh, doing your own media, independent media. Um, cop watch, watching the police, documenting the police and doing uh, legal observers. Any other roles? Medical, donation, yeah, first aid. Oh, that's uh, food and tea, uh, bringing direct support to, uh, to people on a picket line, for example. If they have to leave to get dinner, then it's, you know, action's over. <laughs> so, child care, child care for the same reason. So there's, there's all these ways and more um, that people can be involved and absolutely need to be involved. So even folks who feel that they can't necessarily risk being arrested or something have a very crucial role to play. You know, we can't we can't do this by ourselves. So um, I want everybody here um, to find your buddy. If you didn't come here with a buddy, you can find a buddy here. Or if you'd rather just play solo, you can also just play solo. But there's going to be some stuff we're going to do that involves having a buddy. And this is um, a basic principle of uh, direct action as well. Is you don't go in there alone. You go in there with your buddy. If you were with a group of friends, you could get with your group of friends here. This would be your affinity group. And uh, this is your support system. You are each other's support system. So nobody is going in alone.
opportunity to make their official opinion known to the government, and they have to publish this on their website so they can't hide it. They have to make your opinion known. You can submit your official public comment to the, the, the Canadian Environmental Association if you go to their website at ceaa.ca or .gc.ca, sorry, and make your opposition known. Um, yeah, so I really hope that out of this we can work towards a really strong people-powered movement that will be the real opposition to terrible projects that put the economy and healthy communities in danger. So, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Can people hear me at the back of the crowd? Give me a wave back there. Okay. Okay, thank you. So my name is Gordon, and, and to start, I want to acknowledge a couple things today. The first thing to acknowledge is that we're on the territory of the Coast and Strait Salish nations, and that this land we're on was stolen from those people from the process of colonization. And I want to further acknowledge that our presence here today, and the fact that we live and work in this area, furthers that process of colonization, and that's something we need to keep in the front of our minds and take responsibility for. The second thing I want to acknowledge is that this is one of the biggest rallies I've ever been to in Victoria. When I, when I walked through the crowd from, uh, from Douglas Street to get down here, it looked like there were at least 1,500 people in the crowd. And for Victoria, anyway, it's, it's actually a reasonably diverse group of people. And I want to specifically mention that this was pulled off literally by four or five volunteers in their spare time after work with no budget. Yeah. I hope that's inspiring for people because that's the thing that the oil and gas companies are really scared of. That's the thing they need to be worried about. Forget about the fancy websites and the email listservs and all that bullshit. This is the thing that makes change. <laughs> biggest threat to this pipeline happens when individuals who are scared about the future and worried about the environment get out of their houses and talk to their neighbors and hit the streets to take action and create change. And that's what Enbridge really hates and is going to try and disrupt. So this transition from I to we, this is the thing that's at the heart of really every social movement. And in this social movement, this transition that we're making in all probability is going to lead towards a direct action campaign. I, actually, let me stop there for a second. First of all, when I talk about this campaign, we are going to win this campaign. There is no way in hell that pipeline gets built in this province, and we're going to do whatever it is we need to do to put a stop to it. Send members back in. It's done. We have any number of things to try, and we need to try all tactics we have available to us in the time being, but in all likelihood, as has been mentioned, this is going to end with a direct action campaign in the territory of the Wet'suwet'en Nation. Realistically speaking, a conservative majority in Ottawa is not going to vote no to this province, and is not going to vote no to this proposal or this project. And locally speaking, the, the provincial liberals or the provincial NDP aren't going to be much help either. Right, so this is probably going to be one of the biggest direct action campaigns that North America has ever seen. And someday, after we win, because we will win, but after we win, all of us are going to be able to say that we were here at the start of the campaign that changed politics in North America. And I think that's something that all of us can be really proud of. One second. So, yeah, between now, between this moment that we're in, and the time when we get to tell our, all of our grandkids how amazing this was, we've got a little bit of work to do. And that's, that's what I came here to talk about today. The organizers for this event sent out an email about a month ago asking for suggestions for, for workshop and conversation topics. And I said it would be interesting 
to have some discussion about the other pipeline projects in North America. Because I knew at the time that there was more than one or more than two. And when they said, that when they gave me the go ahead for that, I started doing some research. And I wanted to see a map of what all those pipelines looked at together. And I remember, I remember opening the PDF file and watching the map open up on my computer. And honestly, it knocked the wind out of me to see it. Like it really, like I had a physical reaction to what that map looked like because the continent of North America is covered in a spider web of oil and gas pipelines. There are literally hundreds of them all over this continent. They're all, they're all on native territory and they're all spitting and spurting and wasting oil and gas all over the place right now. And for me, that was an important reminder about how entrenched we are into this dependence on fossil fuels. Now it is important for us to build a resistance to the Enbridge pipeline. It's important because the Enbridge pipeline is really critical to the economic viability of the tar sands. I think it's most important because the people who live on that pipeline route quite literally, literally are fighting for their lives on this issue. And that's all I need to know to want to be in solidarity with them. But after we win, we need to acknowledge that we're not really in much of a better situation than we were when we started because we've still got a whole network and a whole infrastructure of oil and gas pipelines all over this pro all over this continent. And I, I'm reminded now of the lesson, or the maybe it's not a lesson we've learned, but the lesson we've been taught in the environmental movement a number of times over about the folly of single issue campaigning. And I'll use, I'll use the war in the woods as an example. Throughout uh, the mid to late 90s and the early 2000s, there were huge campaigns to stop clear-cut locking of old growth forests in British Columbia. And people fought hard, people won some really important victories to protect the land. And each time one of those victories was won, the logging companies basically picked up shop and moved down the road and started logging another valley. And we're in a situation on this island right now where almost every old growth valley has already been logged and we're fighting over scraps of timber that's been left behind. The problem was that in these, and I don't want to take away from that movement because there were some fantastic victories that were won, but in those victories, we weren't able, we weren't able to address the causes of why those trees were being logged in the first place. And that's a lesson we can take forward into how we address this pipeline issue. Because what we need to do in our resistance to this pipeline is address the reasons why it's being proposed in the first place. There's an overwhelming majority of people in this country who think that pipeline is a terrible idea. All or almost all of the indigenous nations along the route have said no, they're not going to let it happen. And we've got a government that's pushing it forward with it anyway. So why is it that that's happening? And there's a couple of lenses we can look through to understand that. And I think one of the best ones is to take a look at the structure of our economy. This economic system, well, you can say it's fueled by fossil fuels. I mean, it, it requires fossil fuels to function properly. And that means that, you know, for all of us to have jobs and to be able to go to school, to be able to get free health care, for, for us to be able to produce food and to pay farmers to produce food, we need all those oil and gas pipelines to keep functioning in the present moment. But we are really deeply indebted to that system, right? And that's an economic system that's you know, central to our livelihood. And that economic system, well, it's called capitalism, is what it is, capitalism is the system that's running our world and guiding most of our decisions. That economic system was founded on a couple of things. It was founded on slavery. The wealth required to, to found this, this economic system came from slavery, and it came from the fact that Europeans came here, my ancestors came here hundreds of years ago, and forced indigenous people off the most valuable parts of the land and claimed it for themselves. We built cities, we built roads that we controlled, we created a legal system and a justice system, and effectively, we, we colonized this part of the world for ourselves. So those issues of capitalism and colonization are what's at the root of this problem, 